Coach Garner here from HockeyTraining.com and in today's video, I want to talk to you about how to avoid hockey burnout. Look, if there's one athlete in the world who's going to be susceptible to burning out, it's definitely hockey players. Hockey players, with their practices, with their games, with the high impact nature of the sport, not to mention, they also have to strength train, do conditioning, do speed, do agility, among many other things. Hockey players are multidisciplinary athletes, meaning they've got to be good at a lot of stuff. So that means their training and nutrition needs to take care of a lot of stuff. And sometimes a lot of stuff can lead to burnout. But if you emphasize hockey recovery, then we can avoid burnout. And that's really the primary objective of recovery strategies. A lot of people think you're using recovery in order to support performance. And although that's true, from a real sports science perspective, you're more using hockey recovery to fight overtraining. The, the very fighting of overtraining is what allows you to perform better. But hockey recovery can be a very nuanced and individual thing that I'm going to be doing a lot of future videos on because because hockey players are multidisciplinary, they can have fatigue in both branches of the nervous system. They can have acetylcholine depletion, which is neurotransmitter overtraining. You can have depletions in phosphocreatine. You can have just classic glycogen depletions. There's so many different areas at which hockey players can run into recovery problems, injuries being another one. The, what I'm saying to you is that hockey uh, recovery is not an umbrella statement. Uh, it's used as an umbrella statement, but each of these things I'm mentioning actually have different protocols for them. And you want to understand these protocols and apply them within the correct context or else you're going to find yourself doing a lot of hockey re recovery stuff but not really recovering. And that's because you were doing perhaps a repletion protocol for glycogen when perhaps you had an acetylcholine issue or whatever it may be, okay? It's very important to understand that. So what this video is going to be on is an overview of hockey recovery, why it's important, and what are the most effective ways to avoid burnout. We need to understand this because hockey recovery is actually how we make progress. And there's a little tier that I wanna to talk to you about here or a quadrant I wanna to talk to you about here before we get into the three tiers of recovery. The quadrant vertically represents your performance and horizontally represents how fit you are right now. When you undergo a hockey training session, your current fitness will actually drop a little bit. Your current fitness is gonna drop after a hockey training session. Why is it gonna drop? Well, because you're not the same athlete at the end of a training session as you are at the beginning of a session. Just like you're more tired in the third period than you are in the first period. Why? Slight levels of dehydration perhaps, maybe disruptions in your electrolyte balance, glycogen depletion, um, uh, endogenous uh, nutrient depletions. There's so many other things that can be involved here that represent why we aren't at the end of a session who we were at the beginning of a session. Even psychological readiness plays a factor. So our performance decreases slightly. However, if we are taking care of our sleep and our nutrition and our training volume management, a proper hockey player will not only recover back to their baseline of fitness, but they will actually supersede that and achieve a new level of fitness. So this hockey player created a stress through training that signaled the body to not just recover back to their current level of fitness, but what's known as super compensate to the next level of their fitness. That's very important to care about because training is only a stimulus, whereas recovery is the adaptation. We don't actually build muscle, strength, speed, power in the gym. None of this stuff happens in the gym. What you do with your training is create a stimulus for muscle growth or a stimulus for strength development or a stimulus for speed development. Everything you do outside of the gym determines whether or not you're going to actually adapt to that stimulus. You ever met a hockey player who trains hard regularly, but still doesn't get the results that they seek? That's somebody who's all stimulus, no adaptation. Recovery is as important as the training because one is a stimulus, 
The other is an adaptation. Unless you have both, you're not gonna become a better hockey player, period. People tend to overemphasize training and underemphasize recovery, and that's why you see a lot of people just simply not get very good results. What do they do? Well, to illustrate what they do, this hockey player will typically train really hard and experience that same decrease in performance that you're always gonna see at the end of a training session. However, if they're not taking their sleep seriously, they're not taking their nutrition seriously, maybe they're not actually on a structured training program, meaning they're skipping deloads, um, their training volume management in terms of sets and reps, total tonnage moved per week is unknown. This is somebody who might recover a little bit just because you know they still ate three meals that day and, and maybe slept okay. They'll recover a little bit until their next workout. Boom. And then they're down. And then what happens? They're going to recover a little bit because they just kind of eat what they want, you know? And then they go back down again. What is this progression? Overtraining. This is someone who is in a heartbreaking scenario because what we are taught to believe is that you need to dig through the hard times and grind through it in order to make progress. But unless you marry that with an optimal recovery strategy, then you're gonna be working really hard for less performance. Remember, this vertical axis is performance. This hockey player is literally getting worse. This hockey player, this is when you start picking up golfer's elbow. This is when your hip starts hurting. This is when your, your readiness and your motivation for training goes down. This is when, when it's time for practice, you go, Ugh. instead of go, all right, let's go to practice. Like they, this is somebody who's not taking their recovery seriously. When your recovery is serious, then you have the psychological, emotional, and physical readiness to crush training so hard that you super compensate and reach a new level of performance. That is overtraining in a nutshell. This is proper recovery in a nutshell. But one other thing that I wanna illustrate to you is the use of accelerated recovery tactics. So if somebody is going to utilize ice baths or cryotherapy, or perhaps uh, use Advil as a, as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, what this person will do is they will do their training, boom. But when you have the ice bath or you have the cryotherapy or you have the anti-inflammatory drug, they are doing exactly that. They are suppressing inflammation. It's important to understand that the entire reason you're in the gym is to create stress. If you don't suffice, if you don't supply your body with a hard stress that forces it to adapt, then why would it adapt? It won't. The body is the ultimate conservation mechanism. It doesn't want to build strength. It doesn't want to build muscle. It doesn't actually want to do these things because they're very energy expensive. And based on evolution, anything that's energy expensive is gonna require a lot of calories. And evolutionarily speaking, calories weren't so abundant back in the day where our DNA was created like calories are abundant now. So anytime your body doesn't have to do something, it's definitely not going to. That's why we need to create such a hard stress in the gym in order to force our body to become faster, more conditioned, more agile, more strong. So what these people think they're doing with ice baths and anti-inflammatory drugs is they think that they are cheating muscle soreness. Newsflash, muscle soreness is a part of the natural recovery process. So what happens when you take a, uh, if you take a bunch of Advil post-workout or if you have an ice bath post-workout, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a very strong anti-inflammatory stimulus within the body, which reduces the inflammation you created in the gym to stress your body to make progress. So what happens is you'll recover and you'll recover fast because there's no inflammation in your body. But guess what? You recovered just back to your original level of fitness. You don't actually super compensate when you use recovery accelerators. That's very important to care about because your body will never adapt to something that it doesn't need to adapt to. The body, when you create an anti-inflammatory response says, hey, there's no inflammation here anyways. So I don't actually need to get bigger and stronger and faster and more conditioned because if we just suppress the inflammation every time, well, then I don't need a stronger physical structure in order to deal with it. It will do that 10 times out of 10. So 
The general rule of thumb when it comes to utilizing tactics like that is in the in season, that can actually be a good idea because you want to reduce muscle soreness prior to playoffs or a tournament or a game. That's a-okay. Because remember, you still go back to your original level of fitness. You are still going to perform. However, in the off season, when it's very important to build functional muscle tissue and improve all of these measures, and muscle soreness is actually not going to impact your on ice performance, that's when you want the super compensation effect. So avoid recovery accelerators such as ice baths and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the off season. And then during the in season, I still don't recommend non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs simply because you don't wanna have that as a crutch in your life. However, I do recommend ice baths if you're finding yourself sore prior to an important game or something like that, all right? Very important, basic recovery outlines. But if you want to avoid hockey burnout altogether, I have a three tier system that you need to run yourself through. And it is in a tier for a purpose. It is in order of importance. Tier number one being the most important. Sleep being the most important of anything on here. Why? because I could be on the best supplements in the world, the best nutrition plan in the world, and the best training plan in the world. But if I got a bad sleep last night, I'm not gonna be recovered, period. Most all systems in the body are anabolic, which means tissue building during a state of rest. Your neurotransmitters are building up, your endocrine system is creating hormones such as testosterone and IGF. They, these are building up. Growth hormone is being elevated. Even your bones are undergoing a process known as osteoclast and osteoblast to reform and get stronger from the training session. I mean, resistance training just doesn't strengthen your muscles. It strengthens bones, ligaments, and tendons as well. All of this stuff happens when you sleep. So sleep is number one most important thing for recovery. What's after that? your total nutrition. Total nutrition, I say total nutrition because the total amount of calories and food you consume in the day is more important than when you have it. A typical conversation that I'd have with a hockey player would be, yep, coach, uh, I, I make sure I have 50 grams of whey isolate post-workout after every training session. I'm like, okay, great. How much do you have in the entire day though? And they've got absolutely no idea. If you are over-focused on your post-workout window and you don't know how many grams of fat, carbs, and protein you have in the entire day, you've got the cart ahead of the horse. How much you have in the entire day is light years more important than when you have it and will determine to a large degree if you super compensate or not. Last but not least, we have volume management. And this is last within tier one. Volume management, meaning managing your weekly total training volume load. So you should be on a real training program designed by a professional who is managing the amount of sets and reps and total tonnage moved per week that you're doing so that you can optimally recover. But then you also need to manage this yourself because I've run into a lot of hockey players who wanna add a protocol to everything, who wanna add a daily routine to everything, who won't just train, but they have to train and then do yoga and then do mobility and then do stick handling and then do shooting. And then they wonder why the progress isn't coming because they're doing stimulus, 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 and they're never allowing themselves to recover. So training volume management is key. Tier one is the most important tier that you need to have in check in order to ensure you never run into hockey burnout and that you always ensure you are super compensating from your training. You only ever move into tier two once you have mastered tier one. If you do not have a great sleep, you do, do not know what your total daily diet is, and you do not manage your volume appropriately, like training volume management, absolutely key. Some people are addicted to training. I'm addicted to gaining. <laughs> if you wanna actually gain from all of your training, then you need to manage your volume, all right? Tier two is what you do after all of this stuff. Nutrient timing. So once you have your total nutrition in check and it's a regular habitual thing, now we can start caring about pre-workout carbs, pre-workout protein, 
post-workout carbs, post-workout protein, and an intra-workout shake with electrolytes, amino acids, and carbohydrates. This is when that stuff starts to matter more. You will get an added recovery benefit out of it. Other nutrient timing strategies include having carbohydrates before bed to improve sleep quality, including fats with breakfast to improve blood sugar stability and energy throughout the day, among many other things. This stuff is addressed once that is already in check or once all three of these are already in check. Next, we have stress management. Your body, I want you to think about recovery like a recovery reserve. Your body doesn't care where stress comes from. It all goes in the same bucket and takes away from your recovery reserve. So if you have psychological stress, emotional stress, physical stress, or environmental stress, or even physiological stress, these could all take away from your current recovery. Examples, psychological stress could be tax season. Emotional stress could be a tough breakup. Um, uh, physical stress would be your hockey training. Environmental stress could be a sunburn. And physiological stress could be a parasitic or a bacterial infection within your gut. These all take away from the same bucket of your recovery reserve. So when I talk stress management, think about all the things outside of your life. You need to manage those in order to optimally recover. But in the same bucket as stress management, I also like to include realistic goal setting. If your goals are way too crazy, then it's very difficult to remain positive and remain motivated, and it's a lot easier to remain stressed out. So stress management means proper goal setting, but also looking at all of the other things in your life because they all take from the same recovery reserve. Last but not least, we have manual therapy. This absolutely 100% has been proven in research to improve recovery. Fascial stretch therapy, massage, these things definitely work. Any kind of manual therapy where people have got their hands on you and they're working on you, this is great. But it's in tier two because if you slept horrible last night, a massage isn't gonna help you recover. If you eat junk food, a massage isn't gonna help you recover. If you're overtraining and doing too much every day, a massage ain't gonna do anything, okay? So tier one is totally in check. When this is totally in check and you still wanna get that extra edge over your competition, that's when you move into tier two. Now when tier two is absolutely mastered, that's when you can finally move into tier three where advanced supplementation can be utilized. Things such as amino acids, carbohydrate powders, protein powders. I don't really count those because that's something that's probably already being included in tier one. When tier three supplementation is more advanced stuff. Things such as glutamine, things such as ashwagandha, things such as rhodiola, things with excellent, excellent data behind them to improve recovery, but aren't commonly used because they're context specific to either, um, for example, ashwagandha is excellent at improving the testosterone to cortisol ratio in the body. So improving anabolic to catabolic ratios. Rhodiola is excellent in improving neurotransmitter pools. So eliminating brain fatigue, helping improve important neurotransmitters such as dopamine and acetylcholine, um, glutamine, helping improve recovery rates from injury, whatever it's going to be, advanced supplementation, there's a lot of options that are actually very good, can be included in tier three. Hot cold therapy is included in tier three, kind of for the same reasons manual therapy is here. A hot shower or a cold shower is not going to do anything if these aren't in check, but they are therapeutically effective in improving recovery. I just don't ever want you to have the cart ahead of the horse. A lot of people look at this stuff first because it's really sexy, right? And it's that's what's the funniest part. The stuff in tier three is the sexiest because they need the most marketing to prove it, right? Really cool sub sounding supplements, hot cold protocol techniques and technology such as shocking your muscles or massaging a gun on your muscle, whatever it is. This stuff always sounds amazing because they need the most marketing to get it out the door because it's a lot sexier than having vegetables and protein and non-processed carbohydrates. It's a lot sexier than sleeping eight hours a night. It's a lot sexier than making sure you deload once every eight weeks, right? This stuff sounds cool, which is what pulls a lot of hockey players 
players to it. And that's okay. None of this stuff is bad, but it is tier three. All right? So if you want to avoid hockey burnout, you want to first do tier one and then do tier two and then do tier three and always understand that recovery is as important as training because one is a stimulus and the other is an adaptation. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you learned anything here, do me a huge favor and smash that thumbs up button and also subscribe to the Hockey Science Unleashed channel. I want to know your video ideas in the comment section below. And if you're interested in becoming a hockey performance specialist yourself and mastering all of this stuff, then check out the link in the video description. Let's go.